So happy to see you here in Singapore. I haven't been here for a while. And it's a great honor for me to start this meeting. Thank you, Alexia. Thank you, everybody, for bringing me here. So, so let's, let, it, let's start business here. We are, came here to, and I started with a few uh, slides just to uh, listening to Alexia and trying to put things in perspective. And I'm going to talk about the relation between quantum thermodynamics, quantum control, and the resources that are needed. So I hope this fits here. And before I start, these are people that I've been working with. So you can see here a uh, lot of things have been done by Roidan, Shimshon Kalush, Aviv and Amikam Levy, this is the team that I've been working on recently. And on more on control, there is a, an open systems, David Tanner, Alon Bartana, Andrea, and Christiana Koch. So this is people I've been working on these uh, topics. So it's not only my work, it's a lot of it is discussing and talking with other people. So now we can start. So. This is, you can see, the beginning. Any quantum system is open, and we have to think about it. And we have here a few examples here. We have an ion trap. We have a superconducting, Rydberg, NV centers. All these things are open. And we need both a theory, and we have to understand how these things in the quantum regime work. So this is kind of an outline. But let's start here from our quantum energy initiative. And what I'm trying to put forward here, it's closely related to quantum thermodynamics. So a lot of things go together with thermodynamic thinking because that's, you can say, the tradition of thinking about resources. So what are the resources that typically we think about? As you can see, it's energy, coherence, entanglement. And what I'll emphasize here is entropy which hasn't been mentioned yet, but I hope I'll bring it. Uh, we can see that you can see the main, at least from my point of view, consideration that unifies things is entropy, both on the information side and also as a kind of a practical kind of way to try to understand things or give a viewpoint. So <clears throat> let's start from uh, uh, what I would say, resources trade-off. We have resources, we have different types of resources, and we can, th we can think about a, a, a trade-off between uh, resources. So I said I want to start with entropy, and I want to start, you can say, traditionally with thermodynamics. I'm going to talk about the first law of thermodynamics in a little different context. First law means here conservation of coherence. And I'll prove that in a very simple way, you can say that I define an entropy of an observable. What do I mean by that? If I have make a full quantum measurement of an observable, then <coughs> I can define its projections. Here, if I can. This is the laser. Ah, here. This works, somehow works. So I'm defining the entropy of an observable A, by its projections, I do a spectral decomposition. So this tells me the probability of seeing a certain outcome. That immediately gives me the Shannon entropy of this observable. And we can compare that to the von Neumann entropy, <coughs> which is, you can say, an invariant. It is, it's a definition of our state, but it's not an observable in the simple way, because if you want to know what's the von Neumann entropy of a system, you need full tomography. So we have this inequality. The von Neumann entropy is always smaller than any observable entropy. So we have this inequality. And if we think about the thermal state, then the entropy that's relevant is a thermodynamic entropy. It's the ent entropy of the energy state. And it's equal to the von Neumann entropy because our system is diagonal and the energy representation. So <clears throat> this is what I'm going to use. The other thing that I'm going to use is the distance between two, the distance between two 
quantum states, and I'm going to, there are many ways to define distances, but what I'm going to use here is the divergence, which is defined here, and you can see it's not exactly a metric, but it's a good definition of distance. So this is a distance between two quantum states. It's always larger than zero, and it, when the two states are the same, it's zero. So this is a good definition of a distance between two states. And <clears throat> so let's see what we can use, uh, do with these two things. And <clears throat> what I want to use this divergence is a distance to define what I call uh, coherence. How can I define coherence? How much coherence I have in my system? And the definition I'm going to use is a divergence between the state of my system and its energy diagonal. So if I look at my state of the system here like that, I, if I erase all the diagonal states, this gives me the diagonal part of it. So the distance between this state and this state will define the coherence. It's not the only definition, but it's all of them will give the same result that they want to show. So <clears throat> once we see this, and then I say, okay, I'm gonna change my system with a, a certain unitary. And the unitary, its generator is the Hamiltonian itself. You see immediately that it's not going to change the coherence. Why? The von Neumann entropy is invariant to any unitary transformation. And the energy entropy is also invariant to a transformation that's generated by the Hamiltonian since it commutes with the energy representation here. So you can say this would be the first law of conservation of entropy. Entropy, eh, you can say eh, coherence in this definition, but in a way you can prove it for any other definition of coherence, is preserved under unitary transformation generated by the Hamiltonian. So how can I change coherence? You can transfer it. Like we can transfer energy, we can transfer coherence. So if I have a bipartite system, I can transfer coherence from one part to another. This is allowed, but if this is my Hamiltonian, I can't generate new coherence. So how do we generate new coherence in a different way? If we have a semi-classical description, if our Hamiltonian is time dependent, then this falls asleep too early. Then we can generate coherence. You can say what we need for that, that our Hamiltonian doesn't commute with itself at different times. So then we can get out of the energy shell, and then we can generate coherence. So you could ask the question, let's say I'm in a thermal state, which is put like that, and I want to generate maximum coherence. So how can you do that? You could do it by a unitary transformation in general that will change only the energy entropy. The von Neumann entropy is, as we said, invariant to unitary transformations, and we'll go from this state to this state. So you, we, what we want to do is if we want to maximize coherence, we want to maximize the entropy on the diagonal, and then this is a question of resources. If I don't limit anything, I would go to a microcanonical description. All probabilities are the same. That would be maximum entropy and the energy representation and maximum coherence. If I restrict the energy, then we also have the solution. Then we want the canonical distribution on the diagonal, and that will give us the maximum coherence with respect to the resources that we want to put into it, which would be, in this case, energy. So the lesson is that if I want to do things semi-classically, generating coherence costs energy. And this is what said in this, or cost work, which is more appropriate to see. So this is my lesson from the you can say first law of thermodynamics. And then we can think about resources trade-off. Now let's think about the second law in the way. And this is another question that we can ask ourselves is, 
we have a quantum device and we want to cool it to operating temperature, how much would that cost us? So we need a refrigerator. So here's a simple example. Let's say our computer is an ion trap, so what we need is laser cooling. So laser cooling, we can think about it as a three-level amplifier, laser, or the reverse of that. This is work that has been originated by Scoville, 1956. So a laser is a heat engine, but if it's doing in reverse, it's a laser cooling. So how does it work? Here's what we want to cool, this, this part. We pump in this direction, we go here, and we dissipate our entropy in the hot bath. So this is the cycle we do. And then, once we understand it's a heat engine, then we, it's a very simple analysis. We just look at what's called the COP, the coefficient of performance, which tells us how much heat we extract with respect to the resources we put in. So it's the ratio between, you can say, this frequency and this frequency that we pump into it. And it's always smaller than the Carnot efficiency. You can prove that. And if we think about it, if we want to do laser cooling, if we take a euterbium ion in a pole trap and let's say one megahertz frequency and the emission is 10 to the 14th hertz, we get an efficiency of 10 to the minus 8. So it means this is, in a way, how to dissipate entropy. We need a lot of photons to cool it, or a lot of energy to cool it to this uh, temperature. So this would be our cost. And if we take this consideration, you can ask, OK, if this is the COP, which, what would be the operating temperature you get? It, it's 10 to the minus 6 uh, Kelvin. So you see, without going to very complicated physics, just you could say the analogy between laser cooling and a heat engine, we can get, you can say, operating conditions. We already can learn quite a lot. What is the efficiency and what is the operating temperature we are going to work? Now, the question is, is this good enough? The answer, we're, what we need, we're, oper we're operating with hyperfine, so this is typically good enough, not always enough, so at least we know how much it costs us to cool this to operating temperatures. Now, this tells us another thing, if you want to think about it. Why is an ion trap quantum computer better than, a, you can say, superconducting qubit? Because we have to cool less. We only have to cool our ions. We don't have to cool the whole device. So this energy efficiency already immediately answers this uh, question if we look at it like that. OK. So <clears throat> I'm going on with, with trade-off. So now we go to the third law of thermodynamics. And what I have here is a universal refrigerator, which is, you could say, like a transistor. It's a three lead device, and I'm cooling my cold bath. I have, you can say, a work bath, and I have a hot bath. Now, now the arrows here are showed as an engine. If I reverse it, it would be a refrigerator. What's nice, the first time it was realized was in Singapore, in the university here, was uh, three ions in a trap, so this, what I call the tricycle. And how does this work? You can see we have three baths and a device in the middle. So we need three energy filters. You can say a hot frequency, cold frequency, and a working frequency. And if you want to be on resonance, these two frequencies should add up to the hot frequency. This is optimal uh, conditions. And now, for a device like that to, do, to work, we need a nonlinear interaction. So there was a recent paper, just came out now, and doing this in a superconducting device. And <clears throat> so this is what you have to realize. You can say, how does it work? I take a quant from here, I take a quant from my work source, and I dump it into my hot source. This is how it works. So you can see I take a quant from the cold, I take a quant from the working source, and I put it in the hot. So that's why you need a nonlinear type interaction for this to work. 
And once you work this out, you can see there are two laws that you need. There's an energy balance, which is, you can see, the Kirchhoff law in a way. And you have an entropy balance, which I want to emphasize here, which you have, you can see, the sum of the entropy productions on the three baths should be larger than zero. So I want to take certain amount of excitations out of my cold bath, and I want to reduce the temperature as much as possible. So you see, this is diverging, and this is negative entropy production because I'm taking heat out of my cold bath. So I have to compensate it somewhere. So where do I compensate it? On the hot bath. So it means where, where's the resources? Here, I have to put entropy I have to dissipate a lot of heat on the hot bath in order to compensate what I'm trying to do in the cold bath. And you immediately see that if I want to cool to absolute zero, it's going to cost infinite amount of resources. So you have to think when you talk about your quantum device, how cold you want it to be. Where's your ground state? So it already tells us you want to work in high frequency if you can. This will save you uh, uh, cooling. Now, if you just look at this and you ask, okay, you start with a mot and you have 10 million atoms and you want to reach a BC, which is three orders of magnitude lower in temperature than a, than a mot. So how do you do that? You have to get rid of entropy. The main point here is entropy. So you go down in three orders of magnitude in temperature it means you have to dissipate this amount and to generate entropy production. How do you do it in typically when you do a BC? You get rid of particles. You do it by evaporation. So you get rid of three orders of magnitude in density or amount number of particles, and you can go three orders of magnitude down in, in temperature. which you can see just by analyzing this very simple, uh, you can say, inequality. So here's a third law in a, you can say, in a dynamical sense. You can see in general, if you want to cool to the absolute zero, there is a point that you'll stop. And the rate of cooling, this is the current, as kind of a universal scaling. You can say there's a quant that you want to cool. This is a frequency you want to work with. There's a coupling to the bath, and there's a gain. So if you optimize the gain, the temperature, you can see the difference here. You can say that the frequency the, of the, this part here should scale with the temperature. So it means when you cool, you have to lower your frequency all the time. And then you see that the rate vanishes with a certain exponent, and you can work this exponent out. What is this exponent here? Or you can see the entropy production, how it should vanish again when you reach the absolute zero. So these are numbers for, you can see this exponent for Bose Fermi gas, or in this case, you can work this out. So this is the third law of thermodynamics, which again, teaches us that if we want to cool to the absolute zero, it's going to cost us infinite amount of resources. And this has been revisited. I, recently, there are nice papers about that in different contexts. You always come back to the same uh, conclusion. Okay, now another trade-off that we have to think about it, which comes out at, at power. We don't want to work at zero power. We want to Let's say if we have an engine, I'm interested in horsepower. I want it to be run f as fast as possible. So there's a trade-off between efficiency and power, which is, you could say, well-known. It started classically with, uh, you can say, Novikov and then Kohl's and Alboran, but it also works in the quantum regime. If you take the same, you say, universal device that I showed you before, you get what I call this universal type trade-off, you can see. This is power divided by the maximum power, and this is efficiency divided by the maximum efficiency. So you have this type of curve. It always starts, realistically, it always starts like that. 
And the first time I found out about this universal curve, again, came from Singapore. A friend of mine did a sabbatical here and worked on air conditioners. They have the same curve, exactly. And <clears throat> so you can say this is the maximum efficiency and this is the maximum power, so you have a trade-off. And in general, if you want to know kind of a simple number, how much it costs you to work how much you pay in efficiency, half. This is a good number. So if you want to work at maximum power relative to the maximum efficiency, you spend half the power you have to dissipate that. So that's, you could say, not too bad relative to what we saw before, but in a way, there's always a trade-off between power and efficiency. And this is something that has been studied quite a lot in quantum thermodynamics in many contexts, but, and I summarize it here in this, uh, you can see, universal plot, which you can see, again, in many papers. Now, this is more recent. Another trade-off that we have, I'm not going to talk about it, I just will mention it, which is called the thermodynamic uncertainty relation. And then, when we start to think about the quantum device, fluctuations become important. In my car, eh, there are some fluctuations. Sometimes it pairs a little bit in the morning when it's cold, but that's it. And a quantum device, which is very small, fluctuations are important, and you want to minimize them. Otherwise, you don't know what you'll get. So you can see there's a triple trade-off. There's efficiency, power, and fluctuation. So somehow you're living inside this triangle in a certain point and you have to think where you want your device to be. You want how much you want to pay to minimize fluctuations. You could say fluctuations are related to errors. So if you want to suppress errors, you're going to pay for that. And in the examples I'll show you, uh, I hope I can convince you that this is how it works. Okay. So now I'll go to a related topic, but you could say, which goes to quantum control. And quantum control, again, I'm going to talk about an open system. It's subject to the environment. And you can say, the model that you use, I have a Hamiltonian. It has a drift part and a control part. This is standard in quantum control. And you can ask, what are the conditions for controllability? Can I reach, this means, can I reach my objective? And when you talk about closed systems, the change in entropy is zero. As we said, unitary transformations preserve a von Neumann entropy. And there is very good theorems that tells us when things are controllable and when they're not, at least under C star algebra, when our system is closed. And you can see this tells us. In open systems, this is not the situation. This, you can say, is a, still an open question. And you can think about two types of, or maybe more, of, I think about two types of control I want to do. One is state to state. I want to start with an initial state, with this density operator, and go to a final state. And <clears throat> if I want to think about it, if I wouldn't have the dissipative part, my control will be limited because I can only do entropy-conserving transformations. I can stay, if I think about the qubit, only on the surface of the Bloch sphere. Now, if I want to go to cool or to heat the system or to change entropy, I need open system control. I need to bring something that I can exchange. You can say entropy with the environment. So I need the dissipation in order to do state-to-state -state control. But then I can think about process control. If I want to do quantum gate, that's process control. So that's what's written here. So these are the two types of control I want to do. And you can say, can I mitigate the noise? Can I design my control in such a way that it will minimize environmental noise because once I open my system to the environment, 
it's not closed anymore. So these are the problems I want to deal with uh, open system control. And here are examples of problems that we want to do. You can say fast equilibration. I want to reset my computer. This is a controlled problem. I want to do it as fast as possible. So this is called Mapemba effect because this person in Tanzania wanted to cool his popsicles. So he wanted to know how he can do that as fast as possible and he found out that if you use hot water instead of cold water, there's popsicles cool, at least freeze faster. So that's why it's called on his name, a Mapemba effect. But we can think, okay, how can we ch control a reset? There's laser cooling. This is all coming together. Quantum annealing. And we'll talk about gates. So these are the tasks that I want to discuss. And in a way, quantum control, if I want to say it in a nutshell, it works or coherent control by interference. And that's why our intuition is usually not so good. Our intuition, on inter we are classical objects. We think classically, or at least I walk around classically. But interference is something that's not in our, our intuition. But if you want to know how do I do quantum control, I try to create constructive interference where I want it on my objective and destructive interference where I don't want it to go. So this is a general principle of quantum control. And then you can see that the agent of control is coherence. This is what I need. But if I have an open system, I'm going to dissipate my coherence. So I have, you can say, kind of a problem of a trade-off between generating coherence for making control and dissipating it because I'm an open quantum system. So in to put this in uh, perspective, what I need is an equation of motion. Here's the Louisville von Neumann equation. I can describe it either in a differential form, which I'm going to use, or as an integral form, this would be my gate that takes my initial state into this final state. And here's this connection. So already when I wrote it like that, I <coughs> assumed that my, you can say my Louisvillian here has or my map has an inverse. So this is already not completely general, but this is what I'm going to use. And as for my Louisvillian, you have the commutator with the Hamiltonian plus a dissipative part. And <coughs> my control have a drift part and a controller part. And as I said, the dissipator degrades our controllability. Now, what are the origins of environment, or I want to classify it into three categories. One is noise originating from my pulse generator. If I want to do something, you're pressing my laser, I'm going to generate noise. If I don't do anything, there's no noise. So the pulse generator itself is a source of noise. You can write it like that as this double commutator with the a controller. This would be a, a white noise kind of model, a fast noise on my con controller. You can have noise originally from back action. If I measure something, it's going to cause a back action. Again, you can ask, well, how does it influence my system? You can write it as this double commutator with the operator that they measure. And then I have environmental noise, which is thermal, which I can describe as system, bath, and a coupling between them. So these are the three types of noise we want to deal with. There may be more, but let's try to make it simple. So let's start with this noise, which is environmental noise. So here is my system. It's coupled to the environment. The environment has a temperature. It's going to, entropy is not conserved. And the question is, what I need for control is equations of motion. And the <coughs> point is, which I'm already emphasizing here, the main question, is a dissipator independent of the, of the uh, control? And I'll already say it now, it's not. This is an important point. The dissipator and the controller are closely linked. 
So to make a framework, we're going to use a framework of quantum thermodynamics. I have here Carnot and I have Einstein as the founders, so I'm accepting the laws of uh, thermodynamics all the way, so I'm not going to violate them. And the typical thing that you do, you write your Hamiltonian as system, environment, and a coupling. I assume the world is unitary. So there is a global unitary that changes this, the world, which is this density operator. And what we're interested is in a reduced description, an equation of motion of my system. I don't want to deal with the whole world. It's, uh, it's too, if I want to do control, that would be, so there's a part that I assume I can't control, that's the environment. So the reduced description, I want to write it as a map, which has a generator, which is a Louisvillian. I want to use this formalism. Or in a differential form, I want a quantum master equation. This is what I need for, if I want to do control, I need an equation of motion, at least theoretically. So you can say this is the framework. You can write it here. I have the Hamiltonian part, or unitary part, and I have a dissipative part. And what I claim that these two objects, the dissipative part and the Hamiltonian part, are, are closely linked. So <clears throat> in order to advance in the theory of open quantum systems, I hope I'm not going to here. I'm using, you can say, what's called Krauss maps, which are written here, and what's called the GKLS standard master equation, which has this uh, form. So. There is a hidden assumption when you write that. I'm using a Markovian assumption, and the hidden assumption, which is that the system and Beth are tensor product at all times. So this, in a way, excludes non-Markovian effects, which says that they're not, not in, but what I'm going to use for control is this equation. So you can say it's like many things in thermodynamics. It's an idealization. and like many idealizations, sometimes you have to go beyond that. So, but anyway, this is what I'm going to use here. And this is another paper of Lindblad that less people have, are aware of about this uh, important point here. Now, we're going to impose on this uh, equation thermodynamic restrictions. And the reason is, if you look at the standard GKLS or the standard master equation uh, has developed, what it assumes is what's co called a completely positive trace preserving map. It means it conserves probability and completely positive means it can be reconstructed from a Hamiltonian description. This is from the physical point of view. But it has no thermodynamic restrictions, so we added thermodynamic restrictions to the master equation and you can say we want a Markovian map. The environment is stationary. This is an assumption that we put. There is a fixed point, which we say is a Gibbs state. And you can say the final point is a thermodynamic point, is that there is energy conservation. We put the first law, we built in the first law of thermodynamics here. What does it mean? This is another thermodynamic idealization which tells us that the interface between the system and bath is ne negligible. This is in thermodynamics. In quantum, it says that there's no energy accumulated on the interface. All the energy that goes from the system moves to the bath and vice versa. So this is an assumption that we put here. And once we put this assumption, we, we get a certain structure to the master equation, which is going to be important. And what we get is a symmetry. And the symmetry we, we get here, this is this assumption. Here you can see we mean this is the interface between the system and the environment. We say no energy is accumulating here. And once we put this restriction, we can prove that the dissipative part and the Hamiltonian part commute. <clears throat> so when you see something like that, it means a symmetry. And the symmetry is a dynamical symmetry, 
it means that the, this description of the bath is no, there is no clock. It's invariant to time. It's time translation invariance. So our bath can't serve as a clock. This is what it means. For having a clock, we need a frequency. So there is no frequency hidden inside our environment. It means I can change these operations. So this is the physical point of view. But this has also a mathematical point of view. Once I have two operators commuting, in this case, it's in their super operators, but the same thing happens. It means they have a common basis. So if they have a common basis, it already tells me how these, what's called the Lindblad jump operators in the master equation, it means they have to be eigen operators of the unitary part of the Hamiltonian. So we didn't do too much, but we got into far-reaching conclusions. We already know quite a lot about the structure of our master equation. We know that these operators, how they should look like. Now, if we go to a driven system, why do I have to do a driven system? Because I want to do control. So the way you treat that, you enlarge your system. I put my controller as a quantum system, which has coherence. So you, as I said before, I'm transferring coherence from my controller into my system and back. And now I can use the same ideas I had before. So I impose, you can say, a Markovian or semi-group properties here. And I'm looking for the dissipator. So what I do, I am em do embedding my system in a larger system, and then we take semi-classical approximations. We take this part here. We do semi-classical approximations, and we get to a similar relation that you can say in the semi-classical description, the unitary evolution and the full map, again, should commute. So again, it tells us how to construct our master equation for a driven system. We don't have freedom. We have to choose the jump operators to be eigen operators of my free dynamics. So this is what we have here. And so now we know how to at least construct a master equation for a driven system. And we need that, otherwise we're not consistent with thermodynamics. You can say, I can write a master equation, and this I know for a long time, that would violate thermodynamics. That's not difficult to do. You do your mathematics, but you don't do your physics right. So now we're looking for a master equation that's consistent with thermodynamics, and by imposing this energy restriction, we got there. So. We call it name, non-adiabatic master equation. You can say these operators are time dependent. Everything here is time dependent. These are eigen operators of my free evolution. So we know how to construct a master equation that would be consistent with thermodynamics. So we did the first step of control. We already know how our equations of motion will look if we drive our system. And this is what you do when you do control. So this is a most simple example. You want to do, in a heat engine, an isothermal stroke. I want to change my system and do it, doing it in constant temperature, but I want to do it as fast as possible. So this would be, you can see, the master equation that I have here. In this case, it's for harmonic oscillator. It could be a qubit. We can write it in this product form. In this case, we can solve it almost analytically, this uh, problem. And we can get something that I uh, want to allude to. Here, this is the way we do it. It has ideas from shortcuts to adiabaticity, but it's, this is not adiabatic. It's adiabatic, but it's thermal. We're in contact with a heat bath all the time. So, this is the procedure we do it. We write our density matrix in this form. Here's equations of motion for our parameters in this case. We, we can solve them. We impose constraints. We want them to 
obey, and then we can eventually get the scheduling that's needed to do that. But, so this is let, more of a procedure how to do that, but what's important is how does it work. So I want to thermalize fast. So how do you do that? This goes back to Mapemba. If I want to thermalize fast, I want to be as far as possible from equilibrium all the time. So if I just wait, I go outside and equilibrate with the environment. It's 30 degrees out there and it's minus 30 here, right? It's cold. So I just wait. So first I'm going to cool fast because you can say Newton's heat law says that the rate goes as a difference in temperature, but eventually I'm going to slow down. And this is what's going to take the most of the time. So I want to accelerate my equilibration. How do I do that? I try to be far from equilibrium as much as possible, all the time. Now, quantum mechanics allows us a simple trick to do that. Let's generate coherence. Coherence is not an equilibrium state. I, I'm out of equilibrium immediately. So if I generate coherence, I'm far from equilibrium, I'm going to dissipate fast all the time. If I want to equilibrate fast, I would generate coherence first. So in this uh, plot, the energy scale is in this direction. Here is H. So I'm not moving here. I'm going out of equilibrium. This is the trajectory that I'm following for my cooling. So you could say the scheduling means I'm undershooting or overshooting depends if I want to heat or I want to cool. So if I want to cool, I'm undershooting. I'm doing it fast enough that I generate a lot of coherence. I'm out of equilibrium all the time. And then you can say, if you want to kind of break it into pieces, let's say I do it, I generate a unitary. I go outside of equilibrium. I have a lot of coherence. I dissipate it fast. And then I do another unitary and go back to my energies frame. So I started here on the energy frame. I generated coherence. You could say I went far out, and then I eventually found myself at where I wanted, and I can do it much faster by generating coherence. So this is a, an example, at least of intuition, how I can do a reset much faster. Now, it costs me. Why does it cost? Because I'm going to dissipate more entropy. The faster I go, and you can see it in this plot here, if I go fast, I'm, dissipation is large. If I go adiabatic, I'm, as expected, I'm more efficient. So this is this trade-off that we talked about. If you want to do something fast, you pay in dissipation. And here it's very clear. And you can get, this is for a qubit, you can get relations which are like Onsager's uh, relations about, you can see, currents and so on. Okay. Now, let's make our control more general. So I want to here I have an equation of motion, and I want to control it. And you can say I want to do state-to-state -state control or process control. And I want to use the theory of optimal control theory to find control solutions that will lead me from one state to my objective. So this is the point of control. And how do I am going to do that? In optimal control theory, this is an old engineering theory. It was first developed in engineering and then went to quantum mechanics. You s how does it work? You start with an objective. In this case, I want to maximize J. This is my objective, so it's some observable. And then you put constraints. What are the constraints? That the evolution obeys the equations of motion you put into it. So in this case, it's the Louisville von Neumann equations for the open system. So that's a constraint. And you want to constrain the energy consumption. These are the typical, OK, this you have to have. This is typical in control. And what you do when you have optimization with constraints, you put Lagrange multipliers on it. So you have an objective. This is the original objective. This is the constraint here. This is a Lagrange multiplier. In this case, it's an operator. And here's 
This is zero. This is the Louisville von Neumann equation. So we add this as a f our first constraint. And here is a constraint on the energy consumption. So we have a modified objective. And then we get Euler-Lagrange equations. We take functional derivatives with respect to our controls. And we get a way to solve it, which is iterative. And when you you do that, you get the following solution. You get the forward Louisville von Neumann equation that you have to solve, and you get the backwards Louisville von Neumann equation that you have to solve. So this one goes forward from your initial state. That's easy to understand. This goes backwards from your objective. So what happens, you try to meet two points. You start like that, and you meet in the middle, and at that point, you can say, if I know where I want to go, and I brought it from, you can say, the future to, to now, and I know where I started, and I brought it to my current time, then I know how to operate my control and go from where I am to where I want to be, because it's local. So this is, in a nutshell, how this, this works. So once <coughs> I do that, I can figure out how to generate my control field that will lead to my objective. And the same idea works for a quantum gate. In this case, I have to go on a higher level, and you can say in Louisville space. So I have to define a new Hilbert space of operators. So this is what we do first. And then my objective is to get this map. This is my objective, and I want the map to match it. So my objective is a scalar product between my, uh, the map that I want to do and the map that I get. So that's how I define my objective. And you can see this is how we define a scalar product in this case. Now, we have the equation of motion of the map. Again, it's a Louisville von Neumann equation. And we set it in the same way. Here I have the uh, generalized objective. This is what I had before. This is my constraint on the equation of motion and the energy cons construction. So formally, it looks very similar. It's just much more complicated. It's like doing tomography. You have to work in a full Louisville space basis. And <clears throat> once you do that, how does it work in practice? You guess a control field. You construct the master equation, because a control field determines your master equation, as I said before. You get your objective, and you evaluate your control functional, and you update. So it's an iterative process. And you, there are a few ways to solve it. We solve it either a gradient method or using a Krotov algorithm. This is more technical, and I won't talk about it. I'll just show you results that we did that. So here at how it is graphically. You guess a control field. How much time? Five minutes? I have five minutes. Yeah, five minutes, OK. Yeah. And you close, you close the loop. So now. Uh, this is for reset. So this is for a qubit, if you want. And you can say, I want to start on inside the Bloch sphere. I want to reach the surface. That would be cooling. Or I want to reach the origin. That means I erase everything. And you can say, this is the control field that does one objective. We find a solution for that. So let's leave this. This is more interesting. This is a Hadamau gate. So here we did a control for a full gate. So here is a reset gate, and here is a Hadamard gate. So this is our objective. And if you want to think how this works on the Bloch sphere, if I start here, here we chose it like that. If we start at x, I should reach to minus z in this solution. So if you start with a unitary solution, with no environment, you can say this is the solution that goes all around, but it's all the time on the surface of the Bloch sphere. Eventually, it reaches its target. Here, you see the flag. Now, once I add the environment, 
I find myself here. If I take the unitary solution and add my environment, I find myself here. So there are two mis problems here. First of all, I don't find myself at the right place, but then I find myself on, an, on this inner sphere. It means I lose purity. So the, it's both bad. I lose fidelity because I didn't reach the right place, and I lose my purity. Now, if I do control, you can see this is this blue trajectory here. I reached the right place with a fidelity, which is about 10 to the minus 4 in this case, as we chose it. Now, as expected, here you can see this is the Hadama gate, and there are a few things that are important to notice here. Uh, and I don't know uh, if you can see that you, you can, but one is that there is a lot of dissipation going on. You can say, if you ask, what is the efficiency here of my process, I'm spending a lot of energy and I'm dissipating it to the bath. So I'm succeeding to do a unitary transformation, almost unitary, it's not perfect, but I spend a lot of energy to do that and I dissipate it to the bath. So what is it? This is, in a way, a generalized refrigerator. When I think about the refrigerator, I plug it to the wall, or this air conditioning, and I'm cooling here and dissipating it outside. Here I want to do a gate, a unitary transformation. I don't want to cool something. I want that everything is cooled simultaneously. So I'm able to do that by dissipating a lot of energy. So if I want to get high fidelity and get rid of noise, I'm going to, it's going to cost me. So this is what we can learn from this. So here's a Hadamard gate. It works in the same way for a two-qubit gate. We also can find a, a solution that mitigates this environmental noise. And then we also work on a noise on the controller, which is much if you think about it, if I want to do something, there's always going to be noise. So this is a noise that's very hard to get rid of. And our model is a Gaussian uh, noise. Here it's written here. We can simulate it by two types of either phase noise, which is this, or amplitude noise, which looks like that. So there are two different ways to do that. And the fidelity depends if it's amplitude noise or phase noise. But our question is, okay, this is a noise, can we fight it by using control? And the answer is we can mitigate it to quite a lot of extent. Here is an example. This is for a Hadamard gate. You can see our objective is to reach here, this X here. And you can see the, the yellow one is a unitary one without noise, it reaches there. Once I put noise, I find myself on this inner sphere, which means I lost purity and I don't reach the right place. And if I use my controller, I can find a solution with very, a solution with very high fidelity. I reach to my objective, but you can see it's very different from the unitary one. So if you have a system and you model it only by unit and you find a good solution, it doesn't mean it's a good solution that fights noise. There is a solution that fights noise that can f mitigate the noise and it doesn't look like the unitary. And if you take the solution without noise, it's not good either. So now, you, as expected, if there's too much noise, you can't fight it. So you can see it degrades. When the noise starts to go, the amount, this is how much we can, in a logarithmic scale, how much we can mitigate it. For very small noises, sometimes we find even better solutions when we add some noise. If you look at this graph, we're in very high fidelity. We're five digits or something like that. And if you add too much noise, you can't fix it. Okay, so here, I ran out of time and maybe of your patience. So I talked about open system control. The first thing to, to understand that the dissipative part and the unitary part are linked. You can't treat them separately, which is done in engineering. I know that people in IBM, at least, when they do 
use a GKLS equation, they take the dissipative part from one place, their unitary part from another place, and they try to optimize. That's wrong, and it's wrong thermodynamically. It will violate, you can say, thermodynamic principles. Now, we can say we identified control mechanism. So how to do fast reset, that's one control mechanism that we identified in this way, is to generate coherence. And you can say, if we want to do a unitary, the solution is it's active cooling while you're working. So you're dissipating to the environment, and by doing that, you're fighting noise, and you're paying with resources. In our example, how much we paid? About three orders of magnitude. We, we used more energy that was needed to just, if you want to know how much action was needed to generate the gate, we used about three orders of magnitude more to dissipate, to mitigate this noise. So with this, here they have this uh, paper, and I'll stop here. So thank you. Thank you, Ronnie, for this uh, nice uh, introductory talk for the conference. Any questions? Yes. Should I bring the mic there? Yeah. Or you can speak loud? Uh, hi, thank you for the presentation. I just have a question for optimal co uh, control theory. Uh, so am I correct uh, by saying that it's when you have a classical control and you want to optimize the way you control, does that exist for quantum, uh, like you want to optimize the wave function? or I, ju I mean, just a broad question, but... Uh. Yeah, so, so you can see the model here that I have a classical control that I'm using to control a quantum system. Now, I'm not doing it on wave functions because it's an open system, so either I'm doing it on density operators or on gates directly, you can see. I'm, I'm on a higher level because I'm an open quantum system and my objective is also different. Now, you can see there's another model of control, which I think is less explored, much less explored, which is a quantum control of a quantum system. So I would say that's an open question at this point. You can say the uh, thermodynamic analogy is what's called uh, an absorption refrigerator. It has no classical, it's only quantum, but for that, you can say you need the same kind of tricycle idea, which is a, this transistor. You can have three baths, all, everything is quantum, and it's autonomous. You don't have to touch it, it works. So that, I would say, is one element that you would want in, in uh, this kind of a quantum model of a quantum control of a quantum system. So I would say this is something that I would say is exciting and open. The only thing that I know about it, that people try to use AI to, to do something in this direction, that's maybe good, but it doesn't give you insight. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Hi, thank you for a nice talk. Uh, I'm wondering, you already touched on this, that uh, about using these control methods in superconducting qubits. Uh, I was wondering, because these uh, two qubit gates have about a, a fidelity about 90%, maybe 96 around that area. Uh, and I was wondering whether you did some calculations that if you use these control methods that you were presenting here, can you, uh, how much can you increase the fidelity of two qubit gates or if, whether you do something like that? And also, to which extent do you need to know the specific um, dissipation in these superconducting qubits, right? Because they don't, e they don't know exactly where the dissipation is coming from and exact form of it. Thank you. Yeah, okay, so I, I would, okay, there are ma many questions that you're asking here. So let's say first about the scalability. The, this type of calculation I showed is expensive. So we did two qubit gates and we can do three. But you can see that we're doing, it's equivalent to full tomography. I need a full uh, basis in uh, operator Hilbert space to do that. So that's, you can say going beyond three qubits or maybe if I would have infinite, uh, not 
uh, computed, I, I maybe could push it to four, but uh, I don't think this is the, the I think the, the, the point here is more to get insight what you can do. So you immediately can see that once you have an open system control, it's a new problem. The controllability that you think about in unitary cases doesn't work. So how can you solve it? One, let, one way to do that, and this is known in control, is to do it by the, the machine itself can help you. You can, use a, you can do part of the feedback in the machine itself. You, if you, you can put your objective, as in you can find the pulse that solves your problem without solving the Louisville von Neumann equation, you can say the quantum machine does that for you. So this is possible. And I'm sure this is already done because engineers are smart. So they do that. And another way to do that, and also something that we work, you can use a, a random basis. So you don't do full tomography, you do partial tomography on your unitary and you can uh, do quite a lot. So you can increase your Hilbert space to a certain extent if you want to calculate. But at least my point here is, may, mainly to gain insight, what is happening, how does it work, to get a mechanism to understand. So I hope I answered you, or not all. Thank you. Um, yeah, okay, thank you. Uh, well, there are still a few more questions and uh, we are out of time. Maybe one more last here. I also have a list of questions, so I guess I will keep them for lunch. <laughs> Go here. Uh, uh. <laughs> yeah, th thanks for the talk. Uh, I have a question. I don't know, maybe it's possible that you already said it and I missed it, but are the protocols that you find, the optimal protocols that you find, are they dependent on the initial state that you are using? So I want to do a Hadamard gate. Is the optimal protocol that you find different from the Hadamard gate starting from the one state and from the one plus zero divided by square root of two? Okay, the, the answer is, is simple. When you do a control on a gate, it's, it's full tomography. You do it for all possible initial states. You do it on a complete basis in the operator space. That's why it's expensive. It's, it's you can say, much more difficult than state to state. State to state, you say, I want from here to there. That's an easy thing, relatively. So here you do full tomography. So let's say if it's two qubit gate, I have 16 operators, or I have the identity that I don't have to worry about. So okay. 15. Thanks. So those controls are universal for the gate set? Again? The, the controls that you find for the open system. The systems control are, works for, once this control they, they that I showed themselves. you will, will take any initial state to the final state according to the gate that you chose. In this case, Hadama or two qubit gate or something. Now, Thanks. I'll use this opportunity. Sometimes, let's say we do a, a two qubit gate, but we only want to control one. So I have the other one as an oscilla. And the question is, is it helpful? And the answer is yes, especially in a dissipative system, because you can move the noise to the other ancilla. So this is something that we find, and I think this is a good idea, because although I, have, I want to do, let's say, just a Hadamar, I'll have an ancilla, I'll move the noise there and keep my gate quiet. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you again, uh, Ronnie, for a nice talk and the question and answer sessions.